and welcome. We are back here with what I believe, if I've been told correctly, is the final recap or final recap here in English as part of the official AWS on Air 2020 stream. Um, again, typical duo you see here, Rob Zhu, Nick Walsh. Uh, we've been here recapping all of the keynotes throughout the three weeks of reInvent. We've been here at the end of each day trying to sum up everything that we've seen. And this has certainly been one for the books, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's last day of the last week of wave one of reInvent. Uh, what a trip. I hope you've enjoyed the ride so far. I hope you've uh, enjoyed our, our commentary and our programming as part of AWS On Air. Um, it almost feels like things went by a little too quickly. There's so much to take in and digest. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we'll try our best to uh, walk everyone back through the time warp of the last three weeks and cover uh, at, at a surface level everything that happened. Because, you know, even leading up to the event, it, it could have been hard to get all of these on your schedule. And now that they've happened, you want to make sure that you can catch up on all of the things that you can get a chance to see for the first time around. Um, I know, Rob, you and I have been here talking about many of the launches, and there's a lot that we didn't get to go see ourselves. So I'm looking forward to getting to do that after the event is over uh, in the in the coming weeks. But we saw across three weeks, five keynotes, um, a number of executive leadership sessions, something on the order of hundreds of sessions available in the in the digital catalog. Um, and then we here we are over here running the the uh, you know the AWS on air live stream channel. So there was certainly more content than any one person, no matter how many monitors you have, uh, could could have consumed in one go. And uh, we're going to try and recap as much of that as possible in just about an hour. <laughs> that is a uh, tall order. I think I think we have to give the proper disclaimer here. There is absolutely no way we can touch every launch. We can mention every cool thing that happened. We're going to have to pick and choose, and you're going to have to uh, be at the mercy of our, our editorial discretion. But I do want to say that uh, this is actually not the exact end of reInvent. There was so much content as part of reInvent this year that we've decided to create what we call a, a wave two of content. And uh, that will be happening in mid-January. Stay tuned. If you're signed up or registered for uh, this phase of reInvent, you're probably going to get notifications on when and what is going on for wave two. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is AWS Cloud. And I'm sure we'll be posting updates there as well. But there was just so much more launches, more content. We're going to be launching that after the holidays. Um, Nick, where else can, can people stay tuned? Or what, what else is going on that we, we should uh, inform everybody about? Yeah, I mean, God, more content is, uh, it's like after you're, you're done eating this big, delicious steak, and then there's another one that shows up at the table. And you're like, man, I, this is a lot. I, I wish I had the time to consume this, but maybe after I digest it a little bit. But, uh, but again, wave two is, um, you know, at least a few weeks away. That's that's in, I believe it's mid-January. So um, you've got a few weeks before end of year. And then as everyone settles back into the office, uh, pick and choose some of the content that you uh, want to be able to peruse in the second wave. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, we have, we have about 50 minutes and, uh, God, there's, there's so much that has happened at reInvent this year. We can, I think we're planning to go through each of the keynotes. We'll, we'll talk a lot, a, a bit about each of them. There's some continuous threads that, that Rob and I found that, uh, extend throughout each of the, the various keynotes. Um, and there are a handful of trends that uh, we think like sort of underpin a lot of the value propositions in some of the launches we've seen this year. Um, so, you know, without further ado, we could probably kick things off with uh, the first keynote, which was Andy Jassy's over in uh, on the first day of the first week. Again, this is the, um, I believe this is traditionally the longest keynote. Uh, I don't know if I'm mistaken or pulling, uh, pulling that stat out of nowhere, but it certainly is known as the one that has the most launches. Um, we are not going to be able to make a dent in the overall launch list um, from Andy's keynote, but I think we could address some of the, the broad sweeping strokes and um, talk a little bit about the, the classes of uh, services, I think, that, that got some uh, exciting new toys to play with. 
Yeah, definitely. And maybe the way we can think about this is that Andy covered so much. I, I do think it was the longest keynote of all the keynotes. Um, he covered so much across so many categories that we can almost treat this one as an appetizer. So we have so little time, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, but Andy kind of started us off with uh, eight principles for how to reinvent. I'm not going to go into any of them, it, but they are worth watching. Again, all these keynotes are uh, available on the platform. The platform will remain available. All this content available on demand whenever you want to watch it. So just because this is the last day of reInvent Live coverage does not mean it's the last day that you have access to the content. Um, but of course, Andy, always uh, um, classic Andy, opening up with mentions of our um, compute offerings across instances, containers, serverless, exciting announcements here. I'm just going to touch a few of them. Uh, Graviton2, we'll be talking more about that later on and why it's such a big deal. Um, ECS and EKS anywhere for containers and then for uh, Lambdas, uh, our serverless compute offering, we have one millisecond billing, container support, 140 event sources, and a brand new feature called AWS Proton that allows you to fully manage the deployment of an entire microservice architecture. Extremely exciting. We talk so much about how microservices are the future, um, how they help you to better pair your or right size your infrastructure to particular costs to make your teams more agile and uh, sort of first having the building blocks in, in the fundamental compute units like API Gateway and Lambda is very nice. And now Proton sort of helps everyone string it all together. So uh, very nice to see that there. Um, continuing uh, across the set of launches, we have in the storage database space, uh, storage and databases space, uh, quite a few exciting ones. We see GP3 volumes for Elastic Block Store. Um, this, while at first glance may not seem extremely exciting, but when we talk about sort of the nuts and bolts, lower cost, um, greater IOPS, and the ability to now separately provision storage from um, from IOPS, uh, all very exciting propositions that allow you to right size your infrastructure. We see IO2 Block Express, the first SAND built for the cloud. Um, again, alternatives being on-premises SANDs that are extremely complicated and complex to manage. Um, so being able to have that now uh, officially as a managed offering is uh, exciting. I, I feel like that's that's sort of like the the word I go to to a lot of these launches, right? Exciting. There are a handful that I think are are truly game changing that will alter the way that we author or deploy or completely manage software. Um, but a lot of these are just um, just straight value adds or 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 uh, quality of life improvements to processes that folks are already using and. Um, you know, when we talk about that at the number hundreds of launches scale uh, that we see at a single event alone here in reInvent, um, that really adds up in a lot of ways, whether it's the, the happiness of your devs, the um, amount of money you're saving, or, um, you know, hopefully in the case of more resilient architectures, which we'll get to in, in some of Werner's stuff later, um, less time up in the middle of the night responding to uh, outages and on-call reports. Yeah, definitely. Uh, lots of exciting stuff happening in the storage and database space. Like you said, no better word for it than exciting because I think customers that are already operating with these services, when they see these, especially when they see things like better performance, lower cost, without any changes to APIs, just more reliability, uh, that's always a win. But IO2 Block Express, like you said, is a game changer and it's really going to be interesting to watch uh, how customers put this stuff into production. Uh, we also announced, I want to I want to mention a quick shout out here to um, Amazon Aurora Serverless V2. Um, we've been listening to customers um, and the team has made a huge set of changes to make Aurora Serverless even better. Um, Aurora Serverless, again, our fastest growing service in the history of AWS, um, supports MySQL and Postgres compatibility and it costs a 10th of a traditional uh, relational database. So, um, you know, if you're in the database space, uh, you need a relational database in the cloud, you need to look at Aurora. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, going down that same uh, chain there, we saw the launch of Babelfish for Amazon Aurora Postgres, helping customers run SQL Server applications on Aurora Postgres with little to no um, code changes from their traditional SQL, SQL Server um, infrastructure. Uh, and additionally, again, uh, an extension of this, the Babelfish for Postgres open source project under the Apache 2 license, uh, helping customers broadly migrate off of um, other databases, namely SQL Server, and having this sort of proxy translation layer that um, deeply understands and can translate those those SQL Server calls to um, native Postgres. So really excited to see how that one develops across uh, the rest of 21, as again, it's an open source project. 
um, finally in the, in the, you know, space of bringing data, uh, to <laughs> bringing more offerings to where data lives because data has weight and gravity and, and until the end of time compute and, and experiences and workflows and pipelines will always move towards where your data lives. Uh, we see glue elastic views, um, AWS glue again, being our standalone ETL service, what glue elastic views enable you to do is more easily take some of these foundational tools that you understand like SQL, um, and take your, your data that may live in a number of silos and without having to then duplicate it again in another uh, data store that's specific for you as an individual or whatever use case you're trying to do, you can generate these dynamic elastic views in an entirely serverless fashion where you don't think about any infrastructure that is pulling this data or manipulating it along the way, performing ETL. Um, you can simply just have access to it. And, and uh, I, I dare to call it like data orchestration, but it's kind of like data pipeline, like data uh engineering orchestration that's done in an entirely serverless fashion uh with the ability to have all of the data sources and destinations that you love in aws so we're talking the elastic searches s3 dynamo aurora rds um redshift for example right so um where your data lives and where you want it to go glue elastic views makes it even easier to meet you where you are to to be able to get it there yeah that's right um well you know the the what was the quote? I, I'm, I'm actually going to butcher it, so I'm not going to try. But the, the amount of data that we're seeing uh, being generated on an annual basis is accelerating. And, um, you know, data is the new oil. You probably heard that quote thrown around a bit. And so these services are coming at, at the right time, um, in my opinion. You know, the companies are increasingly struggling with solutions to deal with these things. And um, these services are really godsend for them. Now, Nick, I know um, it's almost felt like uh, Christmas came early for you with all of these uh, AI and ML services that have launched. Uh, I know there are a lot of them. Um, can you help us make sense of these? Yeah, exactly. And a lot of these are going to be repeated. Uh, we'll, we won't repeat them when we talk about the ML keynote, but uh, if you are working with training and authoring your own models uh, and, and going from, you know, say you've deployed your first model to 100, these launches are going to hopefully be pretty, uh, pretty obvious in the value that they provide. Uh, it's difficult to wrangle data. Data scientists and practitioners spend way too much time doing that. Go ask them if they're at your company what they don't like spending their time doing. It's probably working with the data uh, to clean it and to be able to transport it. We've launched Amazon SageMaker Data Wrangler. Uh, next up, once you have some sort of you know maturing pipeline, you have probably multiple models. Uh, you may have certain shared features across the, the, the models that are serving inferences. It's difficult to, in a perform performant, cost-effective, low-latency way, uh, have and manage those features, uh, manage those features that need to be um, called in and invoked. They're, they're called features in machine learning. They think of them as columns in traditional databases. Um, we launched Amazon SageMaker Feature Store. Uh, now you have machine learning pipelines probably using things like Data Wrangler or Feature Store uh, or a number of other um, systems, features, what have you. Uh, now you want to develop end-to-end -end pipelines to be able to go from this data ingestion, cleaning, training, testing, validation, deployment, and monitoring. How can you tie all of that together? And there are tools and solutions that help to manage this in the traditional software space, but machine learning has just a handful of gotchas. Uh, and that's why we are very excited to see Amazon SageMaker pipelines to help tie this all together. Next up, we have uh, some additional developments and new services. We have CodeGuru, the intelligent um, code linting and, and operational review um, or, or operation introspection tool uh, in the AI services space here at AWS, launching support for both Python and uh, a security detector. So if I, if I remember that one correct, correctly, it is uh, going to be able to tell you before you have actually launched and are executing code what um, parts of your, um, what parts of the code you've authored could be potentially insecure. Um, again, CodeGuru is super slick. It's, it's trained with a reinforcement learning from thousands and thousands of code reviews here at Amazon. So it's a bit, it's quite a bit more than just going and, and performing search and finds against a handful of, of discrete use cases and, 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 um, and, and keys. So very excited to see that. We also see the launch of Amazon DevOps Guru. Again, this machine learning underpinning of developing introspection and insights in CodeGuru, it's for the code that you author and operate in Dev for DevOps Guru. It's for it's it's this uh, knowledge and introspection into some of your operational metrics. Um, so automatically identify operational issues before they impact your customers with re recommended remediation. And then lastly, 
Well, lastly, we have Amazon Click Site Q, the ability to ask questions in a natural language. It always feels a little awkward when I look at my Google search history because I don't look like I'm talking like to a human. I look like I'm talking to a search search engine, um, and that is a bit of a suboptimal uh, you, uh, you know, workflow, right? We we know exactly what we mean to ask, and Amazon Click Site Q enables you to ask those natural queries. Um, and have uh, natural language processing done on it to the data that lives sort of under the hood there to get you the answers that you're looking for quickly, effectively, and accurately. Yeah, now one of the things that, that you did there was um, you transitioned from talking about SageMaker features to talking about things like CodeGuru, DevOps Guru, and Amazon QuickSight Q. And um, there's, the way we think about AI and ML at AWS is across three tiers. You know, We have infrastructure frameworks and tools and instances for people who just want the bare uh, um, you know, all the tools at their, at their fingertips to, to do uh, really complex workloads. Then we have SageMaker, which is our machine learning tier in the middle with all of these abstractions that you mentioned, Nick. Uh, but then at the top of the stack, um, which is where some of these last, these last three features you mentioned fall, uh, these are our AI services. And these are turnkey services that you can use right out of the box without having any ML expertise. Um, and this trend continues into Amazon Connect. Now, Nick, you and I have uh, had the pleasure of speaking with Nazir and Aaron and other folks from the Connect team. So we're quite familiar with this service. And this is one of these game changers, in my opinion. Um, you know, if you think about what it takes for any company out there to succeed, one of the first things that they'll tell you is customer relations, right? Customer obsession, while it's something that we heavily prioritize here at AWS, it's no mystery to companies across a whole variety of different industries. And one of the core, the core elements of customer obsession is great customer support, which means you have to have a great support experience, great call center experience. Amazon Connect is that in the cloud. Um, this is, as far as I can tell, never been done before. Um, the, the, the no upfront costs to set up a data center. Like if you told me this five years ago, 10 years ago, I would have told you to get out. It's just such an insane lift. And the fact that the service, you know, we, we, we heard from service team members on the Connect team directly that the, the full end-to-end -end capabilities of Connect, if you were to try to assemble them yourself, even on AWS, you'd be paying more than Connect costs. So the value add in, from Connect is just layer upon layer upon layer. And that's not even going into the new features that we've launched at this reInvent. So I'm just gonna go over them really quickly, Amazon Connect Wisdom. Again, this is going to use machine learning to deliver agents uh, to, uh, to deliver real-time information about the issue that uh, a particular customer is, is calling about. Um, we have customer profiles, which gathers rich information about the customer that you're currently supporting, uh, real-time contact lens, Amazon Connect tasks, um, and then Connect Voice ID. These are fantastic features that make Connect even more powerful. And again, this is one of these things where uh, I just, I am so excited that, that we're witnessing this thing evolve right in front of our eyes. Because I think in a couple of years, when we look back, this is going to be another one of those like, yeah, of course, this had to be this way. But really, when you see how the sausage is made, you realize all the steps it took to get it right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I think we're all consumers of various services and goods in, in our lives. And, uh, you know, you have some sort of expectation when you go out of, of what type of support or service you, you receive. And I think that whether it be positive or hopefully not very negative, you remember the outliers there, right? And, and so when I see all of these launches in the Connect space, what makes me most excited is not just, wow, you know, I, I went to go receive customer support and I got, um, you know, stellar, uh, had a stellar experience one time. When I see this launch for Connect, I am so excited for the companies of tomorrow and the, cus the customers of AWS who can now all enable this extremely easily such that I don't have to wait for a whole number of companies that I buy goods from or that I work for, uh, you know, um, call up for support, let's say, uh, to have to roll their own version of this from scratch. So uh, call, call me a little selfish, but uh, anytime I see one of these launches, I get to contextualize it with and multiply it across all of the customers that will be using it. And at the end of the day, all of the people that I know that will get to benefit from those experiences. So um, yeah. really cool I mean, stuff. Just picking a random one of these uh, features out, uh, voice ID, right? I mean, I'm still super impressed when I call customer support for any of the products or services that I use. And just after talking, you know, I hear the automated message that's like, hey, we've identified you based on the words that you've said so far, no further confirmation needed. Like now I don't have to tell them, you know, sensitive uh, information over the phone. That's awesome. And Connect has this support now, right? Imagine a world where every single customer support service that you call has this capability or could if they use Amazon Connect. Um, that's just really a, a huge leap forward in terms of, um, 
improving customer support just across the board for so many industries and businesses. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I said that was the last of the machine learning launches they are uh, leading up to connect, but uh, I, in typical fashion, I'm lying there is there is even more uh, to talk about here, although it was under some of the uh, industry or vertical oriented uh, content here in the keynote, uh, naming those really quickly, you know, if you're in the industrial and manufacturing space, this was probably the Christmas for you, right? All of this was the reinvent for you. There were a number of launches that are, uh, I, I think the best way to, to describe them is, is applied AI, right? You know, there's, there are generalized, generalizable solutions to generalizable problems like broad computer vision or broad uh, text, text detection uh, or sentiment analysis, right? But applying these and delivering that functionality to solve point of business problem is uh, sort of a second order um, challenge. And, you know, we hear you through, from working with you uh, day in and day out. And so we saw the launch of Amazon Monotron, the ability to monitor equipment. Um, so this is using uh, sense, the ability to use audio data, visual data, um, and to have automated anomaly detection to perform predictive maintenance before failure occurs. I think we all can sort of wrap our heads around the concept that it's easier to fix something leading up to a break than addressing the break itself afterwards. Um, and Monotron is a managed, fully managed solution that allows you know everything upstream from the sensors to the gateway to AWS, and then the Monotron app, which you can actually use on a mobile phone to be able to monitor and get sort of a single pane of glass into the health or predicted health of um, all of your on-site uh, infrastructure. I know we talk about infrastructure digitally here, but this is this is quite literally physical infrastructure and appliances and and, and all of that that you may have on site. Um, down the chain here, we have Amazon Lookout for Equipment, an anomalous, anomaly detection service for industrial machinery. I know that sounds quite similar, um, but where this comes in is that you uh, the customer sends their data to AWS. AWS auto generates the model, and we will return the anomaly. So it, whereas in Monotron. Um, you up supply labeled data for when um, you know uh, there's there's both you know uh, functional and non-functional labels uh, for a uh, for a given set of equipment, and so what happens is that Monotron will then um, you know be able to uh, tell you when when uh, you're entering the phase of based on new data that's inferring against. Uh, that you are uh, likely to have a failure upcoming. Amazon Lookout for Equipment um, does this in an even more abstracted way where you don't have to return any of that. So very exciting there. We see the Panorama Appliance and the Panorama SDK. Again, this is a physical device you deploy on-prem. You Customers oftentimes have a lot of sensors uh, in the form of video cameras. And so without the need to be able to install a large number of um, interconnected or IoT cameras themselves, what you can do is you can perform inference against these uh, traditional, more analog camera feeds like CCTV systems, because the Panorama appliance will actually take those video feeds and perform that processing um, directly on device. So very exciting for a lot of reasons, bringing the compute to, um, to the site, but also allowing customers to continue to use systems that may be fully functional that they've already invested a lot of money in. Uh, and the Panorama SDK essentially enables um, more easy interfacing for for uh, manufacturers of smart appliances. So uh, without the need of the Panorama appliance itself, if you are a manufacturer of smart devices, you can more easily integrate into these systems through the Panorama SDK. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, lots of exciting stuff going on with uh, supporting various industry verticals. We'll talk more about that uh, later on in the in the recap. But we also had. Uh, huge announcements in the infrastructure space. Um, you know, we ba we have outposts in two new sizes. Um, we have the uh, rack-based solution, um, for, as well as a, a full-server solution. Um, so these are kind of like one U and um, two U uh, chassis sizes. And then we have uh, local zone expansion. And one of the um, one of the really interesting stories that we heard during this keynote was um, from one of our customers, Riot Games, and they've been using outposts to enable faster deployment of Valorant, uh, one of their new games. And what they've been able to do, uh, Outpost is one component of the N10 solution here. Um, and the other is, is that they, they take advantage of the Amazon global network, but they've been able to reduce latency by 10 to 20 milliseconds um, in a first person shooter. Now, this is a pretty big deal to me, Nick, you know, you and I have both played our share of first person shooters and 10 to 20 milliseconds is actually huge 
because uh, I think what the, the human um, response time is something in the range of like 60 to 80 milliseconds for a professional gamer. So when you talk about 20 milliseconds, that's 30% of uh, 30, you know, more than 30% of the time it takes to react. And to be able to do that, you're, you're creating that much tighter of a game, that much more competitive of a game. Yeah, exactly. You know, when we're talking about multiplayer games, especially ones that require extremely low latency, like uh, Valorant or more broadly first person shooters, but even uh, other genres, latency is quite literally the delay. And when you give an input into a game, when you see a response, and if you're playing any game that is real time, any of that latency is either directly translated to a delay in the response that you see back, or the authoritative server has to manage that. I wish I could geek out about this at length, but um, sort of the the what outposts mean for being able to deliver um, deliver game service closer to players is is really monumental, right? In the old days, you used to have all of your infrastructure deployed in a single data center in a single part of the country, and if you lived far from that data center, you probably had a, a sub subpar experience playing a game. And uh, then maybe you have one on each coast, right? That improves a little bit. But as you're noticing here, when we go from one to two to to n number of potential places to deploy this with the likes of multiple AWS regions, with the likes of AWS outposts, you can get these game, you can get more of these game server locations, you can get them close to your players. And then there is no trade off of, um, you know, having to decide the optimal place to put your game servers, because the answer becomes everywhere. Yeah, definitely. I still remember the good old days of uh, trying to find the best dial up uh, point for my my 9600 modem so that I can get the best ping for uh, those old school games. But that's another time, simpler time. Uh, what do you say we flip over to the second keynote, the machine learning keynote from week two, day one with Swami? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, we covered each of the keynotes at length, end to end, every topic that was discussed throughout the week. Um, but there was actually quite a few AI and ML launches that were already in Andy's keynote. So I think that will make it a little bit easier for us to cover this. Uh, before we get into any of the launches, I think one of the exciting things to call out is, you know, Unless you've been living under a rock, whether you use AI or ML yourself or your company does or, or what have you, um, it's been exploding in popularity. And uh, especially if you're in the AWS ecosystem, I'm sure you've seen that through the uh, pace and the rate of, in which services and features in the AI and ML space are released. Uh, there was one really simple graph that had by year um, the number of features and services launched. And on one side, we had 2016, three, and that was the launch of Amazon Polly, uh, Lex, and Recognition, three managed services in the AI space. Um, fast forward to today in 2020, four years later, we have this uh, up into the right graph with 250 plus features in the last year alone for AI and machine learning. Um, so I don't think this is a trend that's going to stop anytime soon. Again, with foundational bedrock AI services, with uh, what we're seeing on the application and applied AI services uh, to solving particular business vertical problems in manufacturing and, and some other ones that we'll talk about here. Um, I think this is a step in the right direction for helping companies and our customers get up to speed with ML quicker. Um, and sort of dovetailing right off of you know my own quote there, getting up to speed with ML quicker is this broad sweeping sentiment that Swami described, which is giving companies the freedom to invent. Uh, now, this takes a lot of different forms, and we won't dive into all of the particular tenets that he referenced. But when we think about freedom, you know, if you remove the blockers and the challenges, that inherently makes you more free. Uh, companies naturally want to develop features that are exciting for their users. They want to invent new things. So how do we, in the AIML space, take uh, those blockers out of the way? So the first of which is firm foundations, bedrock infrastructure. It should be performant. It should be... Uh, hopefully easy to use, but it should it should be best in breed for cost performance. Uh, and we see that with the newest launch in distributed training for SageMaker. SageMaker, again, the middle part of our three-tier AI stack, bottom tier is foundational services like EC2 instances, deep learning containers, custom silicon, middle tier being Amazon SageMaker, this opinionated orchestrator that helps to abstract all the low-level stuff but helps you have full customizability for training your own models and deploying in whatever custom architectures that you want. And then up on the top layer, we have the fully managed AI services, um, probably the most opinionated, but also help you with just a turn of a key, have some models that are already pre-trained that you can get started with. Um, 
my quick uh, explanation of the the pyramid, I guess you could say there. But again, faster distributed training with SageMaker. Um, when you hit that model dot fit API call against Amazon SageMaker, SageMaker under the hood spins up your infrastructure, distributes all of the data and your model, um, you know, like your models framework across all of the different instances in your cluster, performs that training, spins down all the infrastructure and spits out your model into S3. Cool. It's great. It does that all. You can scale up or down your cluster very easily due to some very particular sort of under the hood enhancements to the way in which the SageMaker, um, you know, control plane scales out that model and, and shares that data between instances on the cluster, customers just have gotten a 40% speed up, um, which means one of two things, either A, you can um, have your models done much faster, finish training faster, or B, um, you can choose to crank up the number of instances in a cluster and in the same amount of time, um, uh, or sorry, for the same amount of money, um, have that training done quicker. And again, that'll be again, contingent on the uh, scalability operating characteristics of whatever algorithm you're using. Yeah, that's a, it's a great call. I mean, speeding up training is always um, a, a win. I mean, th this is, and it's not a linear benefit, right? If you can take a training from, let's say two hours to one hour, that's suddenly, you know, it's, it's more than twice as, as good. I, I'll just leave it there. Uh, but there's also so much more. You mentioned kind of the the end-to-end -end life cycle, right? There's data preparation, collection, setting up the environment, training and tuning your model, deploying it, scaling it, spinning up and down as you're in production. Like the the fact is that SageMaker offers speed ups to businesses in more ways than just having the training phase be much faster. And we see this with customer success stories from Lyft, Vanguard, ADP. Just to pick a few, for example, with Intuit, right? This is one of our first first SageMaker customers, and they had. By using SageMaker, they were able to save customers a collective 25,000 hours for customer support because uh, they basically uh, used SageMaker to detect which kinds of cases needed expert review. Um, and so this is another great example of how customers are using SageMaker to improve their own workflows, which then turns into a better customer experience for their particular business. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you you mentioned some of these benefits just being non-linear. An example of this could be that, you know, traditionally models had to be trained overnight because of how long they took. You know, in the ad with the advent of SageMaker, you can scale up a cluster and and get at least one training done during the workday. And when we see things like a 40% speed up, there are scenarios in which a customer may have not enough time in, in the old scenario to start another batch of experiments but now it can do so. So you can go from one experiment a day to two or potentially even three, or you can parallelize some of these or your money just goes further. Like it opens up so much. And again, even though SageMaker here is in the middle tier, I would say that a lot of those improvements are uh, very foundational, just making something more performant per dollar. Um, and so, you know, when you're talking about the ways in which SageMaker Lite makes life easier for customers, makes them get to market faster with machine learning powered features, there is another slew of launches here. Uh, some of which I spoke about before, uh, in Data Wrangler and Feature Store, but another large number of uh, managed services that are laser focused on solving discrete problems that exist in this end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline. And if some of these problems don't jump out at you right away, that's totally understandable. A lot of times when you're trying to just stand up your first machine learning model, um, there are a lot of challenges, right? You're, you're probably busy wrangling with what is a training uh, algorithm. Right, and how do I perform? You know, what is inference? How do I perform inference? Like just wrapping your head around all the foundational components to stand up, nonetheless walk and then run. Um, and so, what we see here is uh, a, a number of these uh, services that are valuable to customers that have maturing pipelines. So, first, I want to talk about Amazon SageMaker Clarify, available is generally available. Um, you've probably heard of the difficulty in having observability and insight into how machine learning algorithms are performing because you are passing in data. There is an inference or some prediction that is made against that data based on the uh, properties of the training data set and the algorithm. And then ultimately, uh, business logic is written on top of those, uh, those predictions and the confidence values that can mean everything from approval or denial for a loan in a, in a financial services application to... Um, unlocking your physical device uh, if you're just trying to use multi-factor auth for uh, you know computer vision. Uh, SageMaker, SageMaker Clarify makes it easier to understand and have observability into uh, you know significant uh, the, the significance of factors in why a prediction was inferred the way that it was, and largely this takes the form of of deep introspection and, and visualizations. But even more interesting than a lot of this is uh, 
there's a lot of assumptions in silent failure cases in machine learning by which you have um, assumptions about your data set or assumptions about your problem that can be violated silently over time. So examples of this are, if I train a model on all of the cars that are out on the street, but then next year, a, a lot of popular car manufacturers make cars that look a little different, I may not detect this immediately, or the human brain may be able to account for this bias very easily, but a machine learning model, by virtue of the fact that those images are not in its training set, may not be able to. And so detecting that preemptively before a lot of you know, I, don't, I wouldn't call them bogus or bad requests or uh, or inferences are um, served, um, but you know, less accurate predictions are are never ideal. Um, so catch that sort of before it happens with Amazon SageMaker Clarify. Next up, you're running a lot of models in production, and whether you're worrying about the introspection into how they are performing their inferences from a you know a features and a result perspective, uh, another side to that with as with any digital infrastructure or infrastructure period is the, uh, the profiling and, and how effectively um, that application is making use of its underlying hardware. Um, so we're talking things like in the training phase, are we able to make the most use of the cores that we are paying as a customer for um, to perform that, that training cycle? Um, what does the CPU usage look like on, on one of our inference uh, platforms? What does the IO usage look like? Should Are we over-provisioned? Are we under-provisioned? And traditionally, with every single machine learning framework, and I know there are an ever-changing number of them, they change in popularity. Swami talks a lot about that with the shifts in the tides with PyTorch and TensorFlow and MXNet and way back when Thano and Keras and all of that. Um, you know, each of these frameworks is built in a different way such that being able to deeply profile and standardize the ops uh, introspection and observability atop of these is difficult, right? Uh, but, you know, if you're if you're thinking, what I'm thinking, this sounds like undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? Uh, it, at AWS, we work deeply with a lot of these frameworks. We've optimized many of them to run more efficiently on our infrastructure. And so happy to announce deep profiling for SageMaker Debugger as generally available. This enables customers to deeply understand and serve recommendations. Again, so it's more than just surfacing, you know, hey, you're under you're you're underutilized or you're 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 tapped out. Uh, actually, giving pointed feedback and advice about how to then resolve that to either save some money or speed up your training. Um, so really love that. Um, lastly, here, SageMaker pipelines tying it all together. Um, again. Pipelines being an atomic unit here in machine learning, let's call them, and you want all of these constituent parts to have CI and CD. There's lots of uh, unique challenges in the machine learning space to achieving this when compared to traditional software. SageMaker pipelines being the first CI CD style deployment um, service in the cloud. So very excited to see that. And then lastly, and I'll sh at least I'll shut up for a few seconds, is uh, Amazon SageMaker Edge Manager. So take all of the hairy bits about machine learning and now imagine this little world off on the side with IoT and, and devices that are not in a data center that are collecting data, performing inference, low battery, weak processors, um, intermittent internet connectivity. Um, the challenges really start to add up. But if you want to deploy your models to the edge, we do. We want that to be as painless of a process as possible, um, made possible due to some really cool improvements to SageMaker Neo under the hood. You can train a model once in SageMaker and deploy it to any number of end destinations. So you don't have to have separate entire processes. Edge Manager makes it easy to deploy those models easily and then manage them as a fleet of devices all in one place. So you don't have to you know, onboard a whole set of separate IoT uh, experts or these unicorn IoT and machine learning experts and ops. You know, the, the, There's just too many intersections of Venn diagrams here. Um, and you know, a, a lot of our goal is to make it uh, less necessary to um, you know empower more people to be able to to have these features deployed um, without the need to 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 have what could be extremely rare um, or in some cases non-existent expertise. Yeah, I mean, if you're a hands-on machine learning uh, expert, then these features are going to make a lot of sense to you, and they're going to make SageMaker even more valuable. But on the other side of the coin, uh, we have a lot of people who are not ML experts. In fact, this is a problem that we identified um, a long time ago, that there are just not enough trained machine learning experts in the world. Um, and while we are uh, taking great steps uh, and making a lot of investments to fix that as a pipeline problem, in the meantime, we're also trying to enable and bring these ML capabilities to a lot of developers and data scientists that are more used to other workflows. So here we have a set of announcements that are really about kind of integrating ML for um, uh, into the workflows and the tools that data scientists are more, more used to. So for example, here we have Redshift ML, Neptune ML. And the, the thing that these 
uh, tools have in common, these launches have in common, is that you can just invoke ML capabilities right from the same console and the same tools and the same workload that you're already used to, right? And you can see that this is a, a philosophy that we take across different AWS services that we're trying to meet developers where they are. And we'll have more examples of that later on. Um, and then also, again, we, we, we go up and down the stack as we go through a lot of these announcements. Uh, earlier, we mentioned Amazon QuickSight Q, QuickSight ML Insights. Um, but we also announced at last reInvent the, um, uh, the preview of Amazon Kendra, which is an intelligent enterprise search service. And this year, we're, we're happy to announce that there are major improvements to Kendra um, in the form of many, many new connectors. This is a piece of customer feedback that we heard overwhelmingly when we first announced Kendra. Um, and then we also have incremental learning. All this to say that Kendra is now an even better service for performing intelligent enterprise search. It does this automatically. You can use plain language with it. Um, and then we also have a service, a new, brand new service uh, launching in preview mode called Amazon Lookout for Metrics. And you know, this is a, um, we'll talk more about this in, in uh, Werner's keynote, the importance of observability and metrics and logging the relationship between these um, and, and what it means for resiliency for your service, right? This is one of a set of services that we've launched in this space that really kind of tries to make the data that you're gathering a little bit more useful, automatically derive insights, automatically detect what is normal operating boundaries and then helping you set automatic alarms that uh, whenever those thresholds um, are exceeded. And of course, this all integrates uh, in real time with Lambda functions, um, everything that you would expect here. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, um, <laughs> you, you go back just a few years and, and you talk about the skill set required for um, something like this, you are looking at advanced graduate level mathematics backgrounds or, um, you know, significant experience with time series forecasting. And if that sounds like it, a, a skill set that is going to be difficult for you to uh, recruit for, nonetheless, the, the expertise to be able to build a team around, you're, you're certainly not wrong. Um, with the advent of applying and, and, and you know, uh, applying machine learning essentially to time series data, um, you know, having the toolkits in the form of a framework is very helpful. Um, but you know, I think at AWS, we think we can do a bit better than that. And so that's where Lookout for Metrics comes in. Every customer in some capacity has data that is sampled on a time basis. You have time series data, whether it's just sales over time, whether it is, um, you know, utilization of power in some of your buildings or, um, you know, what have you. There's an infinite number of these time series metrics where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is anything. Uh, Amazon Lookout for Metrics essentially says, give me your time series data and we will help, uh, you know, in an automated fashion and build a model that will make it easy for you to understand or have this first glance at anomaly detection there. And, you know, you can build in all sorts of business logic on top of that. You can have this run in parallel with some other systems. You can have this be part of an ensemble of, of number, uh, an ensemble of alarming mechanisms that you may have. But um, as far as a fully managed service is concerned that um, requires no machine learning expertise, I, I certainly see no, see no reason why I wouldn't pass my data um, along here to get sort of that second opinion on whether an anomaly is occurring, um, especially because of how easy it is to use. Um, moving right along again in sort of this, this, this thesis that I have of, of these services being really a, applied AI for given verticals. Um, we have one that's less, or sorry, yeah, like applied AI. I, this one isn't actually necessarily uh, artificial intelligence end to end, but rather is an application of and an understanding of a broad set of challenges in a given vertical, and, and that's the healthcare space. When we think about healthcare, uh, there are a number of compliances that need to be achieved, and, and some of the the uh, check marks and characteristics that go into compliance are things like uh, encrypted storage of data at rest. Um, limited accessibility and auditing capabilities of who has access to that data, um, lifecycle retention policies for that data. And I know I've used the word data a bunch of times and, and you would be astute to, to call that out because data really drives uh, and, and secure management of that data really drives a lot of um, the efforts to be pulled into compliance. Now, AWS here with uh, you know, all of the services we offer in the storage and, and databases space certainly has a large number of customers that are successfully building their own um, data pipelines, data, data storage functionalities, data lakes um, to be able to then have 
secure access on top of. Um, but you know, we figured we could do one better. So we launched Amazon Health Lake in preview, which is essentially a pointed solution that strings together in a secure and compliant manner all of these uh, data sources, some of the end compute options that can extract insights from them. So for example, medical insights with Comprehend Medical, um, organizing data and having interop standards like FHIR, I think it's the fast healthcare interoperability resources. Um, and so essentially this is really, again, it's just, it's one step closer to solving customers' problems than just offering a bunch of tools in the toolkit. It's like, okay, not just a Swiss army knife. Here is the exact Swiss army knife for your industry vertical. And, um, it's, it's all, it's all strung together. It feels like more like buying a product than buying a build it yourself. Um, which again, especially when it comes to compliance, uh, significantly speeds up your ability to, um, get to market or perform something like a migration, right? Uh, we, I spoke to actual healthcare customers this week on the broadcast um, where these migrations take weeks or months or years uh, because of how significant it is to move from on-premises or, or legacy systems into the cloud and to do so with, you know, with the right building blocks. Um, so being not just having the right building blocks, but being able to prescribe them in a, in a sort of uh, well-packaged manner, we see exactly that in HealthLake for healthcare customers. Yeah, speaking of industry verticals, you know, this is another area where I think AWS is unique. Uh, and this partly comes from the fact that we've been uh, building these relationships over, over the, the years. And we've been really investing in these relationships, thinking about what these look like over the span of decades. And uh, one great example of, of, of some of the fruit that this has borne out is um, the fact that Moderna, um, the makers of one of the COVID-19 vaccines, runs on AWS. And they were able to use a consortium of all these services and features to accelerate the delivery of their vaccine from months to weeks. That is AWS powering a lot of that workflow. And that just kind of gives you a really concrete sense of how much this matters and what a difference it can make. Um, well, I think we need to move along. We gotta, if we, if we wanna spend some time on the, um, the infrastructure keynote from Peter DeSantis on, uh, this was the third keynote in wave one reinvent and this was my favorite um, this one always is and it should be no surprise to you nick or, or anybody who knows me um, but this one just has so much packed in here that i can't it's it's painful for me to have to only spend a couple minutes on this mm -hmm. um, but you know he kind of kicked us off with this quote that everything fails and that was the genesis and the theme of of, of all the stuff that he uh he talked about you know taking us really deep into something even as simple as a, as a power supply. How exactly do you get electricity to one of these data centers? How can it fail? Why does it fail? And then what are the remediations? That really kind of set us up with this kind of um, operator mentality, right? Um, we talked about, for example, that the, the UPS that, that we ultimately ended up with uh, has seven nines of availability. Seven nines of availability is three seconds of downtime a year. Um, when you talk about that level of reliability for this kind of core infrastructure, you are really talking about seconds. Um, and that, at that point, you know, every firmware update, every, every modular component, uh, you know, how, how, how many uh, replacements are, on are in stock? Does it use any rare materials? All of these things start to matter. Uh, and I especially like, you know, when you transition this into the concept of and the philosophy behind designing our availability zones, um, you know, availability zones. Yeah, I like the fact that he kind of, you know, talked about this idea that um, availability zones, they weren't always around. Right. I mean, we had Jeff Barr on the show kind of telling us about the very first launch of EC2 where they weren't there. And again, this is one of these examples of like, well, duh, availability zones make sense. But two things to point out, they may make sense when you look at them. But the first thing is that not all the other cloud providers have availability zones. And when they say they have them, they're not exactly clear about what it means. But at AWS, we are specific about what we mean when we say availability zones. These are isolated data centers with independent fault characteristics, yet they live in what Peter calls the Goldilocks zone, which is 100 microseconds to one millisecond of round trip latency, which then enables synchronous data replication architectures. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. Yeah, I mean, I feel like 
kid in the castle whenever I get to watch Peter's keynote, because more so than any of the other keynotes where we talk about AWS services and how we're empowering customers, I feel like I'm shoulder to shoulder with a lot of the customers getting to see a lot of this really, really cool stuff that's happening under the covers myself for the first time. And, uh, you know, we can, we can geek out of this forever, but I think the recurring trend that I hope customers draw from this, but I know that, that I certainly have is just the depth of vertical integration and how deep the innovation goes. You know, he, Peter talked about, you know, it's <laughs> at a certain extent, reliability comes down to, do you understand every line of code that is running an embedded system in some of your power supplies? Right, like this is not just about like, oh yeah, like what is the <laughs> what is the rated reliability off the shelf uh, for a given device. This is about how do we really squeeze every last bit of understanding and performance out of um, you know out of this hardware that we're running. And you know we've seen that all the way down to the silicon level, right? I mean, I, I should say all the way down, but that exists in a lot of different ways. It's even the concrete in the data centers that we build. And, and he talked to that and the efficiency gains of trying to be conscious about processes in which internationally we are working with, uh, working to produce concrete to build our data centers to do so, to bake in more CO2 such that it doesn't enter the atmosphere. Like just the the breadth and depth, I know we talk about that with respect to services, but in, in levels of innovation that we see here, uh, it's just a masterclass, right? If you're interested in the Graviton2 chip, which you certainly should be, if you're interested in Tranium, which was a newly announced chip this year to perform, perform extremely cost, perf cost uh, effective machine learning training in the cloud, um, no one will tell that story better than Peter. We've been hearing it year over year um, with from Werner, from Peter, from Andy in this relationship with Annapurna Labs. Um, but I highly implore you to check this out and see all of it firsthand from him because we will not be able to um, cover that in a you know <laughs> in any quick capacity. Absolutely, yeah. We definitely watched the entire keynote from Peter. Uh, this is my pick of of reinvent. Uh, I'm just putting that out there. Uh, but I think we do need to break apart the the Graviton two launch. Uh, this is this one is extremely exciting. Um, this is a general purpose ARM processor and. It is now available in a variety of instance types, memory optimized, compute optimized, um, uh, machine learning optimized, you name it. And this EC2 instance, EC2 instances powered by the Graviton2 chip are up to 40% more cost effective per unit of performance. And it is so while delivering up to three and a half times power efficiency. Uh, this level of, of um, performance leap forward is pretty unprecedented in this space. And this is another great example of what you mentioned, Nick, which is that, you know, AWS can, can invest in these things because of the economies of scale, right? It makes sense for AWS to invest in these things. Therefore it does. But for a lot of companies, the thing that makes that company differentiated, the thing that makes that company special and what its competitive advantage in the market is, is not going and building custom silicon. But for AWS that runs, you know, compute workloads for so many so customers across so many industries. Yeah, it does make sense. And that's why we ended up with a world-class CPU, seven nanometers uh, fabrication process, 30 billion transistors, 64 cores. I mean, this is a powerhouse of a CPU. And we see this across the board in terms of benchmarks that we've released. So um, one thing, of course, that we have to point out is that it is on the ARM architecture. And this, is, this used to be a barrier, uh, no doubt about it, right? But these days, more and more frameworks, whether it's Node.js, Django, Ruby, go, um, you know, Docker, like just about any workload that you can think of that's popular these days, uh, they run on ARM. So it, it's important to take a look at this because if you, if you consider the collective responsibility we have for meeting uh, carbon emission goals across the world, um, every company that invests in this is in a way investing in a strategic advantage, right? It's investing, if they're, if they're operating in a large enough footprint, they're investing in their ability to achieve or even exceed commitments to the climate pledge uh, or things like the climate pledge. Um, and then you mentioned that this is just one example of how we've been chipping away at that problem. And we've also looked at, we're also partnering with um, our providers. We're looking at the entire ecosystem and some of you know, what, what, what economists would call like externalities in terms of this climate, uh, this CO2 emission problem. Um, but you know, that, it matters because at the end of the day, it doesn't help to just kind of look at our little slice of the problem. We have to go broad. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm seeing a handful of questions here in, in Twitch chat from, uh, 
you know, number of uh, one foot, one person named uh, Force Awakens, you know, the discussing the idea of, you know, like, uh, there can be barriers to, to running on on ARM or, or, or on these Graviton 2 chips. And, you know, certainly while there are some workloads that will be migratable overnight that may have easy migration paths, that's certainly not the case for all of them. Um, I think an interesting call for one of the keynotes here that I wanted to bring up was, um, I forget which it was, it may have been Andy, but he mentioned that 50, no, I may even be underselling it now. There was a some exorbitant number, the majority of workloads that are being built at AWS are actually built on Lambda as the compute platform. So, you know, more than just developing the Lambda or some of these AWS services as, as products that, that help serve our consumers, we use these internally. You know, we've migrated our entire uh, transaction databases from um, you know, from Oracle in the past years to to fully DynamoDB now. You know that that entire migration journey was something that we documented uh, quite publicly and 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 showed that in, in powering Prime Day in, in its entirety to the transaction numbers and the blog posts that we see from Jeff Barr every year talking about that. Um, but we are running a little low on time, so you know, great points on the sustainability side and the efficiency side. Let's move right along here into uh, Werner's keynote. Right? Is that the that's the last one we haven't covered yet? Yeah, that's right. Cool. Well, um, Vernus Kino, obviously something we all looked forward to. Um, very unique in that it occurred in a sugar factory outside of Amsterdam in his hometown, but it was it was a bit cinematic. I, I was a fan of it. But um, you know, let's just get into the launches. So there was the launch of, you know, some may say a little too late, but better late than never, the AWS Cloud Shell. Rob, I know you got to go hands on with this one and take it for a test drive. Why don't you give everyone the 411 on this and what your initial thoughts were? Yeah, Cloud Shell is fantastic. All I can say is this is uh, one of my, one of the tools that I'm gonna be adding to my day-to-day -day workflow. Uh, with Cloud Shell, you just log into the AWS console and you, sorry, that's my dog back there. Um, <laughs> but you, you just launched the uh, Cloud uh, Shell that you're, you're connected to um, and it has all of your, your API keys, your credentials, uh, it's a secure SSH experience in the browser, and you can do anything that you can do with the AWS SDK, which is everything. Um, and in addition, uh, it's free of charge, right? You, you, your Cloud Shell instances, you're not worried about how much you pay for them. They're just free. They come with a gig of storage. And one of my personal favorite details, uh, you can upload and download files from your home directory, and they move with you um, um, as you launch Cloud Shells in different regions. Uh, this is just great because this is one of the most common things that new developers run into, which is like, oh, okay, cool. I have this remote developer uh, connect, connected to this dev server. How do I get files in and out of there um, between it and my laptop? And yes, SCP is the right answer, but this is just a great tool that makes that whole workflow really easy. Yeah, exactly. And then to me, the cherry on top is uh, the one gigabyte of persisted storage. So if you want to return to your cloud, um, cloud shell session and have things like stored um, VimRC bindings or, um, you know, whatever preferences that you have for customizing um, your your terminal, um, you can have those despite the fact that the underlying compute layer, again, while it's free, is ephemeral and will, you know, be booting up um, from scratch essentially each time. But a little bit of best of both worlds. And again, sort of a, a free end-to-end -end experience within the one gigabyte limit and all of the compute being free there um, while extending this really, really powerful quality of life improvement to developers that are new to the platform, but also, um, or to AWS services, but also to folks that are quite familiar with it. So win-win across the board. Um, we also saw the launch of AWS fault injection simulator, uh, you know, maybe night, not quite as uh, well known publicly as AI and machine learning, but chaos engineering, the ability to, um, tune and, and predictively perform, um, load testing and other injection of faults into your application stack, both in the testing phase, but also in production through things like game days, um, has become increasingly popular to building more resilient systems. There is a whole slew of really interesting work that's been done in this space to hypothesize how to more effectively perform these tests. Nonetheless, tools that are being built to be able to perform unique parts and experiments here to test against your infrastructure. And what we see here in AWS Fault Injection Simulator is, um, again, to the best of my understanding, a, a suite of these tools such that if this is something that you are interested in performing, you can come and test 
uh, and have the results and the insight into how your infrastructure is performing against these various uh, chaos engineering experiments, which I know can feel very scary, right? You know, the thought of like throttling your database in production, the thought of um, being able to uh, inject uh, bad headers into requests that you're sending to your API gateway and so on and so forth. But fault injection simulators should be able to be a place where customers can come to have this managed service to perform those tests in a bit of a clean room, right? Think of it like a, a very research lab, or at least if you're going to be doing it on production infrastructure, to be extremely certain um, and, and um, confident in, in exactly how these tests are being uh, performed such that you're not uh, accidentally taking down your uh, production database. Yeah, exactly. And the traditional way to do this is to insert an abstraction layer between your business logic and the underlying services, right? You have a proxy in the middle and then you can inject faults and those proxies will throw exceptions. Um, but again, th that's not perfect. That actually is, n you don't actually know for sure that that's the way that the stack is going to behave uh, when your underlying services go down. And you also have a really hard time simulating what happens when the control plane starts throwing errors. And Fault Injection Simulator is going to—it does a lot of this right now, and the team is going to be adding more and more capabilities um, as as time goes on. Um, and and if you think about that problem for a second, uh, you realize that what you're really doing is you're adding a whole bunch of code into deployment. You're deploying a whole bunch of code that is not uh, core to the the capabilities of the business, right? It's not domain logic code. It's cruft. It's it's more ways that the service can break. And you know we we heard this. Uh, rightfully from Peter and from Werner that everything breaks. You really have to put on this kind of operator mentality. Any code that goes into production can break. You have and to understand. Will, and will break in the fullness of time, right? That right. is actually right. the assumption, this, this realistic pessimist. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's the exact full term that was used, but yeah, everything breaks all the time. That is, that is the exact <laughs> quote you should always be yeah. thinking about. Everything breaks all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, um, yeah. I mean, it's it's really kind of a, a mind shift, right? It, it's a it's a mentality that you have to take into building these things, or else what you will get is a system that is um, very finicky and very difficult to kind of reason about at some point. Um, so you know, fault injection, chaos engineering as a discipline, uh, definitely very important when you start to operate at scale. Um, and then finally, I think um, um, we're, we're near the end of time here, but I just want to mention one other set of uh, launches. These are Amazon managed services for Profana and Prometheus. Um, as you're trying to improve the reliability of your service, one of the key components to understanding those, how those services are operating is, of course, the data. Your logging data, your telemetry, your metrics, tracing, et cetera. Right? And when you're gathering those, da th those data, um, increasingly customers are turning to these services like Grafana and Prometheus to um, help build dashboards, monitor these services, set alarms, uh, track metrics, run queries, et cetera. And uh, you know, these services have, like many other services, um, you know, they have a, a solution where you can deploy them on an instance. Uh, and that instance, when that runs out of capacity, what do you do? Well, you can span it across multiple instances, but then your job starts becoming Grafana ops engineer. Is that really what you want to spend your time doing? We assert that for some of you, the answer is no. That's why we built the Amazon managed service for Grafana and Prometheus. Uh, these are these are completely turnkey solutions, and you can connect them through your data sources. Uh, shout out to TimeStream, for example, um, Amazon TimeStream or Time Series database uh, that you can connect these to, and you now have an end-to-end -end solution where you are not doing ops for either the storing or the querying or the visualization of that data. Yeah, certainly, and you know this is all an extension of this, you know, this open approach to observability and and visualization. And we saw this firsthand earlier in the year um, with the, I believe it was the preview launch of AWS Distro for Open Telemetry. Now, again, in this being an a distro for Open Telemetry, this is not a managed service per se. It's it's the ability to more easily instrument your services such that you are passing that data and consuming that data by some. AWS upstream provider um, on top of all of the traditional ones that are available in open the open telemetry project. And so the, the goal of this was to be able to make it easier for customers that are using AWS to consume the data from this instrumenting tool, open telemetry, that they knew and loved already. And so um, we were excited to see that this was announced as now generally available from, um, from Werner here in this keynote. And that dovetails really nicely into the previous few launches that you mentioned with Prometheus as a metrics collection agent, 
um, on that proxy instance, as well as Grafana as the, the visualization service um, that, again, most most people are uh, used to using and they are happy with and they have no desire to migrate. So we're happy to meet them where they are with a managed service for Grafana. Um, there were so many blog posts and sessions and and deep collaborations with each of these individual teams. I, I have not even been able to catch up with all of them, but I know that there was some content posted by the co-founder of Grafanda, Grafana around how in a very brief period of time, um, our teams were able to collaborate and get this available as a managed service here on AWS. So excited to see that. Hope to see more of that in, um, in the coming time. But uh, reInvent 2021 is not for quite a few months, at least I certainly hope so. So we'll have a bit of a break. Yeah, well, Nick, it's uh, bittersweet that we're here. Um, end of reInvent wave one, uh, just so many exciting launches. Uh, I, I think I'm going to be thinking about a lot of these things and, and how they can be combined to deliver value for a long time to come. Um, you know, there's just so much here. And I, I want to remind everyone that the content will be available on the reInvent event platform. Um, just because the uh, the programming and the scheduling is over doesn't mean that you lose access to that content. It's evergreen, it's on demand, and we encourage you to watch it. We think it absolutely should explore that to your heart's content. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll try to make this, this uh, bittersweet is probably the best way to describe it. I'll, I'll try to make a little so boxy speech uh, short here at the tail end, but if you'll if you'll humor me for just a moment, um, you know I've been at AWS for about two years now, and prior to that, um, I had been a user of AWS. I had helped to to teach folks to use it. I had uh, we were an AWS shop at one of the startups I was at as a customer previously for a few years, and um, you know before joining AWS, I had never been to reinvent in person in Las Vegas, and so as someone who was never there, boots on the grounds as a customer. Uh, my only way of consuming reInvent content was through the blog posts and at the time, this little thing called the, the live stream um, that was on twitch.tv slash AWS. And uh, if you're watching right now, you might be actually there uh, as we speak. But um, then AWS uh, or then reInvent in person, you know, I was then at the desk helping to put on that live stream again for the folks that were at home that were not able to make it to the event. But, you know, there being boots on the ground, it was very much a sideshow in the broad scheme of uh, the entirety of reInvent and all of the, the chaos and fun and excitement. But uh, this year has been a year first for many. And uh, in, in a certain sense, it's, it's more familiar than ever uh, for me being here at a, a live streamed at home digital reInvent. Um, but I know that uh, this is Probably just the first of of uh, a lot of new and excitement, new and exciting ways to deliver content digitally. So uh, I hope any of you who are watching, who have tuned into any of the other content, have enjoyed your stay. We're super happy uh, to hear any feedback, positive, negative, in between. But more than anything, thank you again for uh, the privilege of getting to talk to all of you about this because it has been a whirlwind of three weeks. Um, that is certainly a first as well, um, and hopefully uh, we have more more content on the horizon but with at least a little bit of a break first so thank you everyone who tuned in it's been a real blast putting all of this together and <clears throat> we will see all of you um with this content available on demand we'll be making um probably blog posts maybe maybe some recap videos maybe a ridiculous live stream that tries to recap all of it i don't know it depends um how much coffee we can get delivered at one time rob um but yeah, without further ado, thank you so much for tuning in. This was AWS On Air here at reInvent 2020. Um, for everyone here on the English track, this is the last English session. Uh, but if you are looking for internationalized recaps across a variety, I think it's seven or eight different languages tonight, um, check that out in the AWS On Air blog. Um, we will post a link to that schedule. There we go. I just added it. Um, Oh, the command is not working, but you know everything breaks all the time, right? That's what we should come to expect. So I will get that link dropped in there. Thank you again, and we will see you all at reInvent 2021. Take it easy, everybody. Bye.